Geeks and Geekettes, it's Wednesday morning. It's time once again for Ask Chuck Dixon, where you personally get to ask me questions. And who am I? I'm, I'm Chuck Dixon. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I've been in the comic book industry for 30 plus years, almost four decades of writing comic books. And I answer questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. And uh, happy to do it. And happy to be here to answer all of your questions. And we got some good ones this week. But first, let me say a word about uh, Private American. You'll be able to find the link uh, below this video. Uh, Mike Barron and, and uh, Richard Bonk, two good buddies of mine, have created this awesome graphic novel that's uh, up on Indiegogo right now, and they're getting shadow banned by Indiegogo. If you Google search for Private American, you can find it. But if you go to Indiegogo and look for it, it's like it doesn't exist. And Mike and Richard really need your help to make this project happen. It is the most badass thing Mike has ever written. And as you know, Mike was a seminal uh, writer on uh, The Punisher. Uh, you know, I worked in his shadow when I wrote The Punisher. And uh, this is even meaner than that. And he wrote the meanest Frank Castle ever in my, for my money. So um, follow the link below and go support them. This is a hell of a project. Mike is an awesome writer, as you all well know, and Richard Bonk is an incredible artist. And uh, it just, I don't know, I, 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 I want to see this project happen. I think it's important, and I think we all have to resist this uh, effort to, uh, for censorship. You know, with the, on the very platform, these guys are trying to raise the money, uh, <laughs> money which Indiegogo will get a piece of, by the way. Um, they're being, you know, shunted into the darkness where people can't find them. It's just not fair. We've all experienced this. And, uh, you know, they didn't even know it was happening until they were alerted to it by fans who were having trouble finding the project. So go over there and give them a hand. While we're talking about crowdfunded projects, let's talk about Hunter, Ninja, Bear. This project is up on Indiegogo, uh, <laughs> much wanted site. It has not yet been shadow banned. Ironic because it has ninjas in it. Uh, so, uh, it's got a few more days to go. So if you missed out on the Kickstarter campaign and you want to get a copy of this 360 page graphic novel, this historical adventure epic, this blood soaked saga, 360 pages for 30 bucks. You're not going to be able to beat that with a stick. If you missed it at Kickstarter, you go over to Indiegogo and secure yourself a copy today because it's only got a few more days left in the campaign. And people are loving this book. Uh, and as you can see, it's gorgeous. Uh, Mel Ruby, Rob Hunter, Ivan Nunez, they just knocked themselves out on every page of this 360 page graphic novel. Did I mention it's thick? <laughs> oh. First question, Preston Payne. In the novelization of Nightfall, written by the late, great Denny O'Neill, there is a scene where Bane, shortly after arriving in Gotham, does something evil. Bane hires, uses, and then kills a number of prostitutes while his gang, Bird, Zombie, and Trog, stand by his motel lair, seemingly unfazed by this behavior. Is this consistent with the characterization you and Graham came up with when developing this character? Uh, I always felt Bane was not an outright evil man, but in the novelization of Nightfall, he could give Satan a run for his money. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I hate to admit this, but I never read the novelization. I'm not real big into novelizations about comic book characters. Uh, I never even read them, you know, when I was a, a young man or, you know, uh, Captain America, and Avengers novels and things like that. Um, I never read this. I probably should have. I had no idea. I, this is literally the first time I'm hearing this. So not surprised, though. Denny went a little dark. You know, uh, it, it being a prose novel, and it was a New York Times bestseller, uh, it being a prose novel, it, uh, you know, aimed at adults. I guess Denny felt that he had a license to go that far. I, I never saw Bane as that evil. I've always thought women were his blind side. Uh, 
he's a he's a lonely man looking for love in all the wrong places. But but uh, yeah, I didn't I never really featured him using and killing prostitutes, sort of serial killer kind of thing. But if that's you know that's the way Denny wanted to go, that's the way Denny wanted to go. He didn't ask my permission. Uh, so and if DC was okay with it, I guess it was okay. Uh, a different characterization, a more adult, you know, characterization. But I have to admit, it's a, a little bit of surprise because, um, you know, Denny usually didn't go in for that kind of material. I, I don't know what inspired him uh, to go there. Uh, I, I remember uh, a discussion at one of the Bat Summits when we, you know, me and, and a few of the other writers were surprised that, that Denny didn't like Jim Thompson's crime novel. Because, you know, Denny was such an aficionado of crime fiction. And he, he, he said he didn't care for Jim Thompson. The stuff was too dark and, um, and seamy, uh, which, is, which is what I love about it. Uh, so it um, kind of surprises me. Kind of went Jim Thompson with Bane. Very weird. But uh, thanks for pointing that out. And, hey, we got a Preston Payne twins, man. All right. In a recent grumpy and on-brand interview, I love that description, Alan Moore said he thought when he was writing comic books for Marvel and DC, he was making entertainment for working-class children and not infantile adults. Alan disparaged anyone who could still enjoy superhero entertainment and compared the nerd culture to a kind of fascism. Do you think the old British magician has a point there? Should adults stop reading Spider-Man and seek more mature forms of entertainment like practicing witchcraft? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I've always written superhero comics, mainstream superhero comics, with, with a precocious 10-year-old in mind. I've always aimed them at children, but not pandering to children. I've, I've always written what I felt was mature, and I mean mature in the proper way, Mature entertainment for discerning young people. <laughs> Unlike my novels, which I write for uh, with the idea in mind that someone reading them is serving life in prison. So, uh, but for comics, you know, for superhero, mainstream superhero comics, yeah. I mean, when you write them, you're not writing them for adults, uh, even though. Alan Moore obviously did. I don't think he meant children, uh, killing joke as a material for children. But but I see where he's coming from, even if I don't entirely agree with him. Um, I mean, I still read superhero stuff, but it's generally, I don't read anything new. I read old stuff that I read when I was a kid or wished I'd gotten to read when I was a kid, you know, comics I missed. And part of that is nostalgia. I'm not going to apologize for it. Part of that, it's like, it's like comfort food. It's like, oh, I remember these characters. And I remember this stuff. And I'm reading it, but I'm reading it as an adult. I, 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 I Sometimes when I'm looking at old Stan Lee, Jack Kirby comics or reading old Mort Weisinger era Superman stories, I wish I still had that suspension of disbelief I had when I was a kid. I wish I still had that sense of wonder. Uh, but, you know, it gets sort of beaten out of you as an adult. And now I, I read them. Partly as nostalgia and partly to study the craft, you know, um, to, to look at them with the uh, with the eyes of an adult and in particular the eyes of a comic book writer and say, well, how did they do that? Why did I like this when I was a kid? Why did this work? Why did this comic sell so well? Uh, you know, so, yeah, the, you know, as an adult reading the superhero comics, you're kind of holding on to something from your past. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but. You know, I prefer other genres in comics as I get older. I mean, I still love comics, obviously, but I prefer to read war stories or westerns or dramas or autobiographical comics, things like that, uh, things more aimed at adults. Um, but, you know, I wish there was still that kid in me, you know, but there isn't. There isn't. So, you know, partly he's right. Partly he's just being mean. <laughs> Alan Moore's a mean guy. He tells you things you don't want to hear uh, and seems happy about it. Uh, but, you know, remember, he wrote a lot of really good superhero comics. And they were obviously written from the point of view of nostalgia. I mean, he wrote some terrific Superman, World's Finest kind of stuff. 
uh, it was obviously from the point of view of a devoted fan of that material. And, and I have to say, other than killing joke, um, he was largely very respectful to the source material. Uh, even, you know, even expanding on it and, and exploring aspects of it without breaking it, without destroying it, you know, without rewriting history the way he did on Swamp Thing. Not to say that him rewriting history on Swamp Thing was a bad thing. It was a, it was a, um, it was a great approach. But he didn't take that same approach with Superman and Batman and Robin and, and other characters that he wrote at DC. And uh, I'm trying to recall, did he ever write for Marvel? You mentioned Marvel, but I, I'm not sure he ever wrote for Marvel. I, maybe I'm just forgetting something. <clears throat> okay, Stephen East or Stephen East. I was just curious how continuity is ideally dealt with in comics. Is there like a Bible of characters' history? Characters history and everything that has happened, things that thing that did put me off comics and made me gravitate to manga was the continuity. For the most part, though, manga does have some problems, but compared to comics, much more straightforward. I will never forget, it was a Hulk comic where the art just changed drastically. I can't remember if it was a mid-issue or from one issue to the next, but Banner looked like a completely different character. Now, DC had a style guy. And they would update it. And uh, I don't know if they sent these out. to. They didn't send them to writers. I don't know if they sent them out to artists or not. But they had the style guide. And obviously they could make Xerox copies from it. and Things like that. And send it out. And specifically how each character looked. Uh, they also did Who's Who. Which was mostly a retail thing. It was a way to do a style guide and get paid for it. Marvel did the same thing with their guide to the Marvel Universe, but Marvel never had anything like that. If they wanted you to work on, if they wanted an artist to work on a character, they simply just gave them comic books with that character in it. And said, so, you know, make them look like this. Um, what you're talking about is probably a change in artists where it might have been a stylistic change, and so Bruce Banner didn't look like Bruce Banner anymore, or it, it could have been pure ignorance and they didn't give him any reference, or it's just like I, I don't really know what Bruce Banner looks like kind of a generic white guy. I'll just draw him however I want to draw him. Uh, so I don't know specifically what happened, but it was always jarring to me as a comic reader. I mean, I, it still is today when art would change mid story or from one issue to the next in the middle of an arc. I'm still kind of burned by pre skull war, pre scroll war, not being completed by Neil Adams. You know, even though John Pesema did a great job on the last part, I'm still in, in sort of a, Drew Geraci kind of rage <laughs> that, that it wasn't, you know, of a piece. It wasn't all by the same guy. Uh, it used to jar me. But, you know, as I said, you know, uh, DC, I don't know if they still do this, did a very diligent job about uh, maintaining and updating their uh, style guide so that, you know, there was a great level of consistency. And then continuity in the storyline itself, that was up to the editors. And some editors were better at it than others. Uh, Denny was terrific at it, you know, handing out guides and essays and updates and, and things like that to keep everybody on track. Because, you know, as a comic reader, you want consistency. And consistency is difficult in a, in a um, you know, long-form storytelling medium like comics where these stories and characters have been around for 80, 85 years now, getting on to 90 years, some of these characters, uh, and maintaining consistency over that time period is, uh, it takes diligence and it takes work. Um, the only other company that I ever worked on that had a Bible were, was CrossGen and they had Bible after Bible after Bible. I can't tell you how many ring bound folders and binders I had to keep in my office that I never looked at because uh, <laughs> they all pertain to the cross-gen Uber story, which I found tiresome and tedious and tried to avoid at all costs. Uh, I made uh, oblique references to it now and then to keep um, the people in the front offices happy, but otherwise I ignored it. But, uh, but at cross-gen we had, you know, we had each other right there on site. So if, it was never a problem with consistency because you're dealing with the same core creative team all the time. Uh, you're dealing with the guys who basically created the imagery for these characters. And uh, even if they were replaced, they were still in the building. 
uh, to lend a hand. So, uh, yeah, continuity is important. Consistency is important, especially in a long form medium like comics. It's, you know, Superman has to look the same today. Clark Kent has to look the same today as he did in the 50s. That's just the way it is. Damien Field, do you feel that comics as a whole can become the escapist entertainment source that it was for the majority of our lives beforehand, or is that going to be a become a niche market that the legacy companies ignore as they push their corporate back cause of the day? You mentioned about separating the artist from the art, and for a long time I was able to do so. My favorite writer, Dashiell Hammett, was a left-wing socialist, which I only discovered years after finding his novels and short stories, but now it feels like the art takes a backseat to political orientation. In the material presented for far too many. Um, yeah, Dashiell Hammond, he, he said he was a socialist, but I never saw that in his work. And that's important. You know, that's separating the art from the artist, but I never saw it in his work. He seemed like a real politic kind of guy, a real world kind of guy. Actually, not that interested in politics. Uh, so I never saw it reflected in the work. Nick and Nora Charles are certainly not the creations of a uh, hardcore socialist. But let's talk comics. Yeah, I mean, the woke agenda, which I, I see an end to. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. This woke agenda has is, is, is got to go away simply because of, you know, commercial considerations. And we see over at Warner's that, you know, they got a new head honcho in, from the Discovery Channel. And it seriously looks like... Uh, he may be bringing an end to DC Comics as an ongoing publisher and begin licensing characters out. I'm hearing very, very serious rumblings and rumors uh, that I can credit to people who know what they're talking about, that they will begin licensing out not the Magnificent Seven characters, the core characters of DC, but a lot of ancillary, you know, backbench B-level characters. Uh, they'll be licensing them out to other publishers to see what they can do. And I look forward to that because we've got to get away from whatever the hell it is they think they're doing at DC and Marvel and get back to um, producing comics that everybody can like comics where the creators aren't saying, you know, if you don't, if you didn't vote for the guy I voted for, I don't want you to buy my comic books. I may mean my comics to people that are only exactly like me, which, um, Alan Moore mentioned fascism <laughs> earlier. It sounds a lot like fascism to me. Uh, everybody's got to be like me. Everybody's got to like the same things I like, or you can just go to hell and stay there. And of course, politics, you know, woke leftist politics have always found their way into comics here and there. That is not to say that superheroes have been political from the beginning. I think that's a uh, misrepresentation of what superheroes are as wish fulfillment characters. But um, I remember back in the day, uh, DC, because it was headed up by a woman who was, you know, very much a uh, Upper West Side liberal, New York liberal. Uh, she had a lot of Upper West Side and Upper East Side liberal friends, and she would, you know, nothing against Jeanette, but she would show off to her friends by occasionally doing highly politicized uh, comic books, you know, always featuring Batman for some reason. Uh, they did an anti-gun one, you know, pro-gun control Batman graphic novel. And then they did this one about the horror of landmines because the media was just got themselves all worked up about landmines. I guess they were done being all worked up about them spraying alar on apples uh, or the coming ice age. And they decided this was the new thing that they had to focus on. And I remember they approached me first to write this. <laughs> Uh, because they knew I would do the military. Um, I, I kept up with military affairs and I would do the homework on the subject. And I said, I don't want to do an anti-landmine book because I, I, I like landmines. <laughs> I like the fact that, you know, uh, Marines, Army, Rangers, whatever, can establish a forward base in territory where they're vastly outnumbered and use landmines as a force multiplier to protect their forward operating bases. I kind of like landmines. I also pointed out that the United States was one of the few countries that did landmines that had a shelf life. Uh, we had produced landmines that over time would de be deactivated. They would simply, you know, 
like those batteries you left in that flashlight for too long, just the mines would just go bad and they wouldn't explode anymore the way World War I mines occasionally still explode in, in France and Belgium to this day. Uh, so I refused. And then it was funny, years later, I found out they had approached Graham for drawing it and he basically gave them the same speech. <laughs> so, so yeah, get the politics out of comics, damn it. Make them something that everybody can read. I mean, superhero comics. You want to do a political comic, knock yourself out. But, but as far as mainstream superhero comics that are supposed to be primarily for children, you know, leave your politics at the doorstep. You know, we're not interested. And, and it, it makes the comics boring. Superheroes should be universal appeal. Everybody should be able to pick one up and read it and project themselves and see themselves in the heroes and, and, and enjoy the conflicts and suspense and all the rest and the humor and all the rest of it. Uh, but not, not a political agenda. Stephen Lolito, I have been listening to your questionnaires on all week and it has been very entertaining. You mentioned that M. Night Shyamalan, poor M. Night, uh, copied your comic, Invasion 55, which you can read for free on Arctunes, by the way. And I was in color for the first time, just slipping another ad in there for me. And I was wondering if you had ever suspected another comic writer was copying you. Also, have you ever had a rivalry with another writer or creator? And if so, how did this affect your creative process? Well, my earliest rivalry was with Mike Barron. It was a friendly rivalry. Uh, Mike knew I admired him, idolized him, probably made him uncomfortable telling him how wonderful he was all the time. Uh, but when I broke into comics as a professional, um, everybody remembers Alan Moore and Frank Miller and blah, 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 and they were at the top of the heap. But when, when I broke in, uh, which early 80s, Mike was the guy. He was the man. He was the one everyone was looking at. Everyone was looking at Nexus for how the comic book should be written, how a comic book should look. It was the bar to reach for. And, and I looked at the stuff and I thought, man, this guy's work is so intelligent, so well thought out, uh, written obviously with verve and passion and earnestness that I wasn't seeing in any other comics. And um, I wanted to be Mike. <laughs> so when I got into the business, uh, you know, my approach was always the same as his, you know, a, 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 a uh, comics are an elegant balance between words and pictures. You use cinemagraphic storytelling, cinema techniques, which Mike did. Mike, 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 I don't know if Mike still does this, but he would actually draw the comic out, you know, in these rough sketches. So uh, the artist would just follow his story, much like Harvey Kurtzman, follow his storytelling. And, um, you know, that was the, you know, that's the, that's what I wanted to do. And, and, it, and it became a rivalry as I started to, you know, move into the business and get more and more work and became a direct rivalry when, when Mike was the main Punisher guy. And again, the guy to beat, he set the bar for Punisher. Other people had written Punisher before Mike, but Mike sort of, you know, drew a line in the sand. He, 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 he uh, did a lot to, uh, enlarge the character, to explore the character, to enhance the character, to, to give you an idea of what the inner workings of Frank Castle's mind were through the, through the war journals that he wrote and stuff like that. And so, as I said earlier, I worked in his shadow on the Punisher, but I very much wanted to write the Punisher. And he's really one of the only comic book characters I actively pursued, uh, pestered the editors with, you know, ideas and stuff like that, which, which Mike became very aware of. And uh, we had a rather bizarre first meeting uh, at a Chicago con, which I've told before. If someone asks, I will tell again, uh, in which Mike told me that I would never get to write the Punisher, <laughs> which is proven wrong. But, but uh, like I said, it's a friendly rivalry. I support, uh, obviously, from my little thing about private American earlier, I support everything that Mike does, and you should too. Uh, did I ever have any bitter rivalries? No, because for a true rivalry, you have to uh, have respect and and like <laughs> and recognize the value of the person you're in competition with. And there's really not a lot of other writers in comics that I saw as a competitor like I do Mike. 
Uh, and Mike, Mike sees me as a competitor as well. Cause he's always telling me to stop writing so fast, which is crazy for a guy who turns out as much material as he does. Uh, it's not a race, Mike. It's a marathon. Now, as far as other creators stealing stuff, no, it's not other creators. You got to worry about it's editors. And I've told the story before um, and I'll briefly review it here. <clears throat> I, I presented a Spider-Man one-off story idea to a Marvel editor who told me that the, the idea sucked and uh, that I wrote the character with contempt, uh, that I didn't like Spider-Man, which nothing could be further from the truth, uh, and then proceeded to uh, write the same story himself, uh, which appeared like six months later in the comics. So I've had editors steal stuff, but I've never had, uh, and, and all creators have had editors stuff the famous story about darwin cook and axel alonzo which um at marvel which resulted in axel alonzo getting a pitcher of beer dumped on his head at a con uh <laughs> oh. so it's editors you got to watch out for not your other uh fellow creators not to say that there aren't some creators that wouldn't be above it but it's never been my experience kevin cruz he's got a bunch of questions uh, and they're all on one subject so no no twin spin for you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> what's your experience as an apprentice in the comics industry, and how do you compare it with new creators that came in after you? Was that apprenticeship culture disappeared or decreased in, your, in the current days? How would you build an apprenticeship culture? Would you personally take on an apprentice? I, I was never an apprentice, uh, and I don't remember there ever being like an apprentice program. The closest I can think of is that Marvel in the 70s, advertised in New York newspapers for people to come and work for free at Marvel. They gave you the grand opportunity of working at the Marvel offices for no pay, uh, doing filing and running for coffee or whatever else um, the editors might want you to do. That's the closest I ever heard to an internship. And a number of people who ended up writing in comics took those jobs simply so they could be on site and, and pester editors. Um, I never wanted to get into the business that way because that's like you know how many asses do you have to kiss before they buy a story from you uh, i always wanted my work to sell itself on its merit and i always wanted to be seen as a professional writer not a spider-man fan who just wants to write spider-man uh, so when i finally began seriously approaching the comic book companies I had a background. I had been published. I, I had written children's books. I had worked in advertising, doing storyboards and things like that. You know, not a lot of either, but I did have a history and I was a professional. I had been paid to create this work. I had been paid to write and draw children's books. And I had been paid uh, as a you know, storyboard guy in advertising. So, <clears throat> you know, I felt I was ready and that's how I approached the work. So I pretty much got the, you know, jobs that I got initially at Eclipse and at Marvel uh, based on the fact that I was a professional working writer uh, who, who knew how to meet deadlines, who knew how to deal with editors, who knew how to deal with artists. Uh, so I had this background. Uh, I don't think there's ever been an apprenticeship. I mean, it may be, I mean, certainly there are mentors. I mean, I had mentors in the business. I had Larry Hama, Archie Goodwin, Denny O'Neill, but, but they came after they hired me. I was hired as a professional writer and they helped me with advice. I mean, even Don Daly as, as um, unusual a character as Don is. And I say that in the nicest way. I love Don. Uh, you know, these people would, they were, I, I referred to them as my rabbis. If, if I'm not Jewish, but I, but that's in, uh, in police parlance, a rabbi is the cop that you go to, the older cop you go to, to uh, for his sage advice and experience. And I would often go to them, uh, but I was never an apprentice. Uh, I think when they hired me, they saw me as an equal. You know, they, if they didn't see me as an equal, they would never have hired me. So I kind of like came to the, well, you know, <laughs> not to make an illusion in this picture, which is about apprenticeship, but I kind of came to them fully baked, uh, ready to go, you know, and after a few assignments, I proved that, you know, after I worked with Larry and Archie and Denny a couple of times, you know, or even just one time, they realized, okay, he handed the work in when we asked or before we asked for it. 
and we liked it. And we didn't have to make a lot of changes and he didn't need his hand held. He didn't need a lot of advice and he didn't call us pestering us with questions. Uh, he just took the assignment, did the work, handed it in on time and everybody was happy with it, with the end result. So yeah, I never really apprenticed anywhere. Uh, you know, when you're a writer, you approach it with a mix of ignorance and confidence, a, uh, a formula I still use to this day, and you just sort of jump in and do it. I don't know any other way. Uh, it's like when people ask me about, you know, what, what did you go to college for? Uh, well, I took up space and time. <laughs> I went to community college for like two semesters and didn't really learn a damn thing. Uh, I just read a lot. I read a lot of books, read a lot of criticism. And that's how I like prepared myself to be a writer. And, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, would I encourage an apprentice? No, my stock answer to that. I don't do workshops. I don't do apprenticeships. Uh, I don't have interns because I don't want to encourage competition for a while for comics experience. If you don't know comics experience, it's an excellent online school for producing comics with, with some terrific teachers and really terrific students. For a long time, uh, not a long time, but for like a year or so, they were paying me to review students' manuscripts. And that was fun and educational for me. And I saw a lot of excellent work. I mean, truly excellent comic book writing. Makes me wonder why comic book writing isn't better if there's that many people in it with that much talent uh, who want to be in it but can't get a break. Uh, I, I think I'm going to blame that on gatekeepers. And gatekeepers is part of an apprenticeship program which is another reason why I don't like apprenticeship programs. They'll, they'll pick an apprentice for all the wrong reasons. And I think you know what I mean. Okay. John's long box. I recently purchased Snakehead and La Gringa, your first two books of the Sidewinders. These are Western prose novels. What is the name of the third book? And is it out yet? It is not out yet, but you can order Snake Hand and La Gringa, my two uh, Western epics, uh, Snake Hand created by myself and, uh, John Morgan Neal. Uh, you can buy them at Amazon or you can buy them directly from Castalia House, my, my new publisher for these Westerns. Uh, my usual publisher, Wolfpack, refused to publish these Westerns because they were too violent, which uh, is the highest recommendation I can give these books is yes, they are. They're very violent Westerns, very as much as I can make them true to life Westerns. And yes, I'm about halfway through the third one, but other assignments keep intruding. It's called Gallows, and it is part of the Sidewinder shared universe. A couple of characters from previous books show up and play a major part in uh, the third book called Gallows, and it will be um, probably out sometime next year. I just, I got to finish it. I'm working on a new Lee Von Cade novel now, and I've promised myself as soon as I'm done with it, I will write the third Sidewinders book. And if I can ever get Mr. Neal to uh, finish the uh, his work <laughs> on on the volume of Sidewinders I assigned him. Uh, that one will be out as well. Are you listening, John? Borgie, wake up, wake up. Okay, Daniel Jackowitz. I wanted to see if you had any stories about writing Stephanie Brown you could share or any plot lines you wanted to do with her had you stuck around at DC and you returned to Robin. Any team-ups or character interactions you wished you could have written for her I really enjoyed the few times she got to hang out with Black Canary, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, I had plans for Spoiler. I've detailed this in previous videos, but maybe you haven't seen them. Uh, my idea was that, uh, you know, Tim Drake would, you know, for a variety of reasons, decide he didn't want to be Robin anymore. He had enough. He had enough of the Batcave. He had enough of Batman. And he gets an offer. From Blue Beetle. It wasn't like he quits. He just, he get, he actually gets an offer from Ted Cord to be the new Blue Beetle, which when you think about it, perfect fit for Tim Drake. He's a tech guy, all the rest of it. Um, and so Tim leaves. He, he leaves and he apprentices. There's that word again. He apprentices with Ted Cord in a six issue miniseries of the Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle didn't have his own book at the time. I thought here's perfect opportunity. Six issue mini of Blue Beetle. Robin, the, the old Robin, Tim Drake, becoming the new Blue Beetle. And it was going to end with the idea that um, Tim Drake would go obviously go back to being Robin, but Ted Cord would get the idea from this 
of franchising Blue Beetle, something they did later with Batman Incorporated. Uh, he would franchise Blue Beetle and hire a variety of different Blue Beetles. So every major city in North America would have its own Blue Beetle. Uh, because, you know, it's let's face it, Blue Beetle at DC, very technology-based character. And it would he's a, it's a hero format to be easy to replicate with different characters, you know, male, female. You know, I thought it just would appeal to DC. They could have an army of Blue Beetles, and it would sort of give Blue Beetle a new meaning to the DCU. At the same time, when Tim Drake left, uh, he would be replaced by Stephanie Brown as Robin for those six months. Now, this is an idea that DC rejected over and over and over again. I described this idea to a group editor at one point, uh, and he loved the idea, but I wouldn't tell him the name of the character Tim Drake was going to replace. And, and finally, he said, well, what, what's this character Tim Drake's going to replace? And I said, Blue Beetle. And he said, I hate Blue Beetle. And that was the end. That was the end of it. And uh, so I kept attacking this idea over and over and over again, and DC kept rejecting it. And uh, I, I never understood why. They never gave me a good reason why. And especially because they you know, eventually would use, did, did I say something about editors stealing ideas from you? They would eventually use the um, idea of franchising a hero with Batman Incorporated. And also, almost as soon as I left DC, they made Stephanie Brown Robin for a while. And that was a basically, I think, just an FU from the group editor. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that idea you love and you tried to push for years. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do it without you and do a crappy job at it uh, and have no real reason for why we're doing it. Uh, to me, it was an elegant, you know, solution that would have made money because it would have brought the Blue Beetle back into the fore, given the Blue Beetle and Ted Cord a new role in the DCU, uh, brought new attention to the character, and uh, also would have helped the Bat Books because, you know, you want to shake things up every once in a while, and Stephanie being Robin would have been a cool idea. I would have looked forward to writing that. Uh, did I have other plans and team ups? Yeah, she was on kind of a listening tour of the DCU. She was teaming up with one female character after another. I don't know if you ever saw the Huntress spoiler uh, special, which I have fond memories of. It awesome Eduardo Barreto art with was that Bilson Kevich on these? I'm not, I can't remember. Uh, that was a that was a cool project. So anyway, uh, yeah, I had plans for spoiler, but uh, they got spoiled. <laughs> hey, Dan Jackowitz twin spin. Do you consider yourself a cat guy, dog guy, or some other pet kind of guy? I've, I've always had pets. When I was a kid, I had uh, geckos and skinks and animals. You could get them for 50 cents at the pet shop. And uh, I had a bunch of them. Uh, I had two older sisters, so we always had uh, uh, various <laughs> animals, cats. Uh, I had a guinea pigs for a while when I was a kid. Uh, and of course, you know, dogs. I had, a, I had got a dog when I was 12. Uh, I wanted a dog and a new bike. I got, I got them when I was 12. And uh, I've had, you know, a series of dogs since then. And uh, even for a while, I owned a quarter horse. Did a little bit of riding, had a quarter horse for a while. And uh, that was uh, fun and a lot of hard work. Uh, but... You know, I am, um, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I am a cat guy these days. Uh, my wife, who used to hate cats, uh, basically got adopted by a cat who showed up in a blizzard back when we were living in Pennsylvania. And uh, she is still with us. Uh, 18 years later, that cat is still with us. And um, my wife's soulmate. And uh, uh when we got to Florida, we adopted a male Tonkinese cat that we named Bruno, and he became the uh, source of, uh, he became the namesake of my publishing imprint, Bruno Books. And there's Bruno right there on the logo. So these days I'm a cat guy because uh, uh, dogs are a lot of work. <laughs> and, and it's hot outside in Florida. Native Floridians never go outside, go outside and walk the dog. If I had a fenced-in area, uh, yeah, I'd probably have dogs again. I had a fenced in area where they could run. I used to live rural in Pennsylvania. The dogs could run in a big, big old backyard. 
but doesn't seem right to keep them in the air conditioning and only walk them a couple of times a day out in the Florida heat. <laughs> so, okay, what you watching? What you watching, Chuck? What you watching on TV? Uh, people ask me all the time. Got anything good? Got anything you can recommend? Uh, here's a few, um, well, <laughs> not suggestions. Uh, the Watcher on Netflix. Yeah, don't watch The Watcher. I'm, I'm warning you right now. Don't watch The Watcher. It's a story about a uh, couple and their uh, kids who move into a um, suburban house in an upscale neighborhood, and somebody's watching them. Uh, somebody's sending them weird notes in the mail, and they suspect all their neighbors. Supposedly, this is based on a true story. The true story is the people bought this house uh, in uh, outside New York, upscale area, Westchester County or whatever, and uh, they got a nasty note in the mail as they were moving in and told the movers, forget it. And they never moved into the house. <laughs> Not exactly 10 episodes of material there. Uh, so the creators of the show just made up what might have happened. And it goes nowhere. This is one of these typical Netflix shows that I really hoped that the miniseries, uh, The Woman Who Lived Across the Street from the Girl in the Window, that's the title of it, I really hope that that satiric miniseries making fun of this kind of show would end this kind of show. But Netflix keeps buying them. The cast is great. It's slickly produced. The directing is good. But the story just follows itself up its own butthole. And it's not worth watching. Don't do what I do and stick through to the bitter end and then kick yourself thinking, I could have been doing anything else but watching this. I could have been sleeping rather than watching this and been more productive with my time. Do watch Delhi Crime. Delhi Crime is also on Netflix. It's a, uh, especially the first season is excellent. And this is based on true stories and follows the facts a lot more than Watcher did. Um, it's uh, produced in India, made in India. Um, and it's an excellent police procedural mystery kind of story. The first season deals with a horrific crime that literally, uh, changed how Indians view um, the criminal element and crime. It changed the country. It created new laws, uh, mandatory sentencing, all kinds of things, new new ways of investigating. It's, it's really, I, I love crime stories set in different locales where you can see the mindset of people at work and how justice works in that environment. And this one's cool because it gets into how few cops there are in India how overworked and underpaid they are and how, you know, to be a policeman in India, you've, you've got to be a dedicated dude um, or, or, or woman to work in this environment. But, um, and, and like all Indian productions, it, it gives you the full impact of the ghastliness, the heinous nature of the crime without ever showing you anything. It's all done through description. Um, Indian productions tend to avoid, the more uh, seamy elements of, you know, American or European productions, but they still get the idea across. You're not, you don't lose anything in them dealing with the material in a more circumspect manner. In fact, to me, it makes it more resonant that we didn't see the crime that happened. We just hear it described afterwards by witnesses and uh, in the gathering of evidence. But well-acted, well-produced, uh, not the feel-good production of the year, but uh, well, well worth your time. Okay, this one's kind of obscure, and I don't know where you'll see it. I have no recommendations. Find it somewhere. The Gold of the Seven Saints. Clint Walker was Cheyenne on TV in the 50s and early 60s, and he was like the biggest thing to hit, hit TV. Uh, he's big anyway. I think he's like six foot six. Uh, and, you know, he felt he was being used and abused by Warner, so he, he quit. He quit the number one television show in America because he didn't want to do appearances for free and he thought he was just being treated like a serf. Warner's had absolutely, Warner's tried to replace him. Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> so they basically said, you know, what do you want Clint to come back? And uh, he wanted to be paid for appearances. He wanted more money. He wanted residuals and he wanted a three picture deal. At Warner's, and so he made three westerns, and this is the middle one of the three. All three are excellent, but this is my favorite of the three Clint Walker westerns. 
and one of my favorite Westerns of all time, as obscure as it is. Um, it is a straight up adventure Western, black and white widescreen. I don't know why I love widescreen films in black and white as much as I do, but I do. Uh, I guess it reminds me of sitting in the Waverly Theater when I was a kid. Uh, it stars Clint Walker and Roger Moore as two guys who find gold uh, and try to keep it a secret. And throughout the, it's one of those stories that begins after the beginning. We don't see them find the gold or anything else. We, we very cleverly join them in the process of trying to hide the fact that they found a lot of gold. And everybody's chasing after them. And it's, um, it's just a really fun, well-constructed action Western. All shot on location. Uh, there's lots of shoot 'em up and fights and stabbing and all the rest of it. Roger Moore and Clint Walker have a real chemistry. Uh, Clint Walker is just, you know, ultimate macho dude. Uh, but he gets to be, he gets to play it a little lighter here. Roger Moore is playing it very light with an Irish brogue. And uh, my wife uh, watched it with me and she was just astonished. She had never seen Roger Moore this young and obviously never seen him play an Irishman before. Uh, it's very much uh, like an Errol Flynn appeal uh, to him in, in Flynn's uh, lighter roles. So yeah, it, it's a it's a really fun western. If you ever get a chance to find it anywhere, uh, it's the Gold of the Seven Saints, directed by Gordon Douglas, prolific uh, director. Frank Sinatra's favorite director. In fact, all three of Clint, Clint Walker's westerns were directed by Gordon Douglas. They're all worth checking out. Uh, it's Halloween, so I always check out of franchise that I'm familiar with. So I watched all four of the Insidious films. If you know anything about the Insidious series, it's, you know, James Wan and Lee Wanell, the, the guys who created Saul and James Wan being the guy behind Conjuring, my favorite uh, horror franchise. And, you know, it's more spooky stuff, but you know, it's, it's good stuff. Good cast, well-produced, lots of, sh you know, um, jump scares a uh, great concept about um, characters, you know, people being haunted rather than uh, houses, rather than environments. And the, the four movies are, are pretty solid. Um, what I like about these movies is that it's unusual in that the protagonist, and these are, these were enormously successful movies. They didn't cost much to make and they were hugely profitable. But what I like is that the, main protagonist is, is an elder, you know, a petite elderly woman <laughs> who's, who's, you know, a clairvoyant ghost hunter or whatever. And then also the addition of her partners, uh, this sort of goofy pair of ghost hunters. One of them played by Lee Wan L, the, uh, the creator and writer of, of the insidious series. And all four films are solid. I probably like the first one and the fourth one, the most, I didn't like the third one the first time I saw it, but on rewatching it, I actually like it a lot more. It's uh, it's a, it, it tells a little bit more of the backstory of um, the lead character uh, uh, played by an actress whose name escapes me, but she's one of those character actresses that you've seen a bajillion times. She's got like 200 screen credits. She's been in everything, everything you can possibly imagine from TV shows to Farrelly brothers movies. So, um, anyway, hey, if you want to contact me with suggestions, uh, questions, pictures of your dogs and kitties or, or horses or guinea pigs, <laughs> contact me at brunobookstore.gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com is the most reliable way to submit these questions. Yeah, you can submit them below the video and I'll find them. Uh, but, you know, maybe I won't. I might miss them. BrunoBookstore@gmail.com is the most reliable way. And I, I have a bunch of questions now, but I always need more. And uh, if you have questions based on the questions you saw today, or is there some minutia I think I've demonstrated, I will delve into the deepest minutia you've ever seen. I can be so trivial. It'll just, you know, knock your socks off how trivial I am, which is an odd way of expressing it. Um, but before I let you go, Hey, have you heard about Spin Rack? I've been promoting this on social media and everywhere else, uh, but Spin Rack is a brand new comic book venue, Web3, Metaverse, all those terms you've heard and don't quite understand, and I join you because I don't quite understand them either. 
But what Spin Rack is, it's creative driven, it's creator owned. These characters are not licensed. This is Graham Nolan and I as founders, along with some of the top tech game development people, Hollywood people. Uh, this is a brand new venture, a brand new way of presenting comics. It's Comics 3.0. Uh, it's called Spin Rack. Um, it'll be comics, games, uh, all kinds of tchotchkes, all kinds of physical merchandise based on basically a shared universe of everything Graham Nolan and I have created over the years. And that's Graham Nolan's, um, you know, Nolan verse is, is compass comic stuff. Um, you know, monster Island, uh, Joe Frankenstein, which he and I created together, alien Alamo. Uh, eventually all of my stuff will be folded in my sister, Suprema law dog, uh, something big iron ghost. So, this is like a huge venture with really good, really smart people behind it. Uh, it's called Spin Rack. I have multiple links to the Facebook page and the site as well. So you can sign up for all the information, find out more about this. And uh, I urge you to be a part of it because I think Spin Rack truly is the future of comics. This is not crowdfunding. This is not anything like that. This is the next step. This is the evolution in the comics revolution. And uh, it's going to lead to, uh, you know, like a multimedia experience in a way. Yeah, physical comics, digital comics, everything else. Uh, but it's going to lead to a, um, just a different way of doing things. And like I said, it's, it's uh, you know, it's me and Graham, you know, working together uh, with, you know, some truly creative people. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and, you know, I, it's hard to describe, especially for a techno noob like me. But trust me, it's it's going to be an exciting new venue. And it's worth taking a look at, worth getting in on the ground floor. And if you go over to SpinRack.io and sign up, you'll get continual updates on what it is that we're doing there and what it means to you and uh, all the cool stuff that we will be presenting to you in the future and all the new creations that we are coming up for this venue. So until next time, thanks for listening, liking, subscribing, all the rest of it. Thanks for spreading the word about this uh, site, uh, this channel, and I'll see all of you down the road.